Welcome to East Auburn Baptist Church. Welcome, 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 welcome to East Auburn Baptist Church. Welcome. welcome. This is the EA Kids Worship Week. Join us as we sing praises to God. 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 We're glad you're here. 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 We are glad you're here. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Welcome to East Auburn Baptist Church. This is the EA Kids Worship Weekend. Join us as we sing praises to God. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from destruction. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles.
Before the mountains were brought forth, forever you have formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. or joining us online, please visit eabc.me slash connect so that we can connect with you. Here's what's happening at East Auburn. Are you planning on serving with children? Protection policy training is taking place on Saturday, September 11th at 3.30 p.m. This is a required class for all those who work with children at East Auburn. Please sign up at eabc.me slash events. On September 11th from eight to noon, we will start a safety care class. This four session training program is for anyone who has or is interested in working with children with disabilities and behavioral issues. The training involves a behavioral management method that heavily emphasizes de-escalation and ABA type teaching methods. Please go to eabc.me for more information or to sign up for this class. 
Our annual business meeting is taking place on September 12th at 1230. All members are encouraged to attend, and we would really like to see you there. Join the youth for a special Operation Christmas Child event on September 12th at 6 p.m. as we hear a young man's story of receiving a shoebox for Christmas. Experience the result of giving to God's work and learn how to fill a shoebox to give. Light refreshments will be served and families are welcome. Grief Share is beginning on September 12th from 1 to 3 p.m. Grief Share is a weekly support group for those who have experienced the loss of a loved one. Visit eabc.me slash grief share to sign up. The Prophecy Study Series is beginning again on September 12th from 1.30 to 3 p.m. Join us as we study the promise of things to come. Visit eabc.me or contact Roger Dumont for more information. Registrations are now open for both our Boys Christian Service Brigade and Girls Gems Group. Please go to the eabc.me slash events to sign up for the fall groups. There are many ministry serving opportunities and Bible studies going on. Please check out the events and get involved pages at eabc.me for more information. If you would like prayer, please come to the front of the sanctuary at the end of the service where someone will pray with you. Or you can add your request to the prayer chain by emailing prayer at eabc.me. Thanks for joining us this weekend. We hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning, church. How awesome was uh, the worship this morning? <laughs> My name is Sean Doyle, and I'm one of the elders here at East Auburn, and um, we have a number of people we're praying for, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for our youth, for our children, um, God, for the ministry volunteers that um, help with them every week and are, have been planting seeds, God, for years, and um, Lord, we know that those seeds that are planted will be, uh, will be things they'll remember for the rest of their lives, and we just thank you for that, the countless hours, the prayer that's poured over those children, and, and God, we thank you for um, the church here, for all of the ministries we have that serve our community in, in so many different ways. Lord, um, thank you for being our God, for being our Father, uh, a good, good Father that we can go to in prayer, that, um, Lord, we can depend on in our, our times of struggle and need and uh, our times of worry, uh, God, that you're always there for us. God, I thank you for your body here at the church that you've built, uh, all of the people you've called and brought together that serve in so many ways and uh, God, for all of the, the gifts and talents within this church, the people that are available to lift each other up, to pray for and encourage everyone, and God, we just, we pray over your church service today, uh, over our worship, our, our prayer, over uh, our teaching, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified through it all. God, we just, uh, we lift up a few individuals at our church this week, God, we pray for, um, we pray for strength and encouragement for Jean Varney, Lord, for Jason DeMonte, that you would just strengthen their bodies, God, minister to them, and um, Lord, we pray for a few individuals who lost loved ones this past week. We pray that you just surround their families and, and comfort them, that you would uh, make your presence felt for the LeMay family, God, for Bob and Jerry, and Jerry's wife, Helen, Lord, we just pray that you would... Um, be around the family, Lord, for the father of Rita DeRosiers who passed away this past week. God, um, we know as those families gather to celebrate their loved ones' lives that uh, there will be opportunity, God, for uh, you to be glorified, for people that maybe don't know you to um, hear of your greatness, your goodness, your kindness, your grace. God, we pray for our, uh, our military. Lord, for Gary Smith and his family serving in the Marines, uh, we know they're stationed in New Orleans, and God, we, we know that there's a lot of devastation there, so many families without homes and um, struggling that they don't know where their next meal might be coming from. They have no place to call home. So God, we just pray for the people that are going to minister in those areas, um, for the cleanup and all of the 
all of the work that's going to happen there, God. Um, in, in devastation, we sometimes spend more time on our knees, more time uh, thinking about who you are. And God, in our desperation, we cry out to you. And God, I pray that as a country, uh, we spend time on our knees crying out to you. God, as a church, that we would spend time crying out to you. Lord, um, for our, our military, for our leaders, for our politicians, God, we pray that uh, they would spend time on their knees crying out to you. God, our, our needs are great, but our God is greater. Um, Lord, we just thank you for who you are, for um, the fact that, you know, you can fix the big problems, the big needs that exist in the world, but God, you're still personal enough to um, be there for us personally in our time of need, in our little needs, and that you still care, that you want to hear our needs. So God, we just pray for your blessing over this service, over your word. God, um, let your Holy Spirit move in our lives, and we just pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Just want you to know we have about 35 minutes, which is a little longer than usual. So just so you know, it's only seven after, and we go until quarter two. So later on, you guys aren't banging your watches and thinking I'm going way over and I should have stopped. Um, we have a lot of time this morning. I'm glad to have that time to uh, continue the teaching in the book of Philippians. We're going through the book in an expository way. That means we're moving through it as as it was originally written. It was a letter. It was a letter from Paul the Apostle. He wrote it from prison, um, and uh, he uh, cared about the Philippians. Um, he loved them intensely, and uh, he took time uh, to give consideration to their needs and the struggles that they were going through. He was brought up to date as to what was happening with those in Philippi uh, by Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus may have been the pastor of the church of Philippi, some commentators would say. Nonetheless, he was from Philippi. He was a brother in Christ that traveled uh, from Philippi uh, to uh, a Roman prison to minister to Paul, to bring ministry funds and support and encouragement from uh, the people of Philippi to Paul in prison. And now there's this reciprocating relationship, Paul with them and them with Paul, and uh, they're caring for one another. And we're supposed to have those kinds of reciprocating relationships with others. Now, as we go through chapter 2, as we look at our outline this morning uh, that we've been moving through, we are in the last two parts of our outline. Uh, last week, we introduced giving glory to God, what it meant to glorify God. Paul had a determination that in his life and ministry, whether by life or by death, that Paul was going to magnify the Lord. And we'll talk about uh, what that means, the glory of God, and how we are called likewise as created by God and created as new creatures in Christ that were to bring glory to God. And then we're going to see that uh, Paul was... Um, willing to set aside what he wanted to do and where he wanted to go for their good that they would grow. And uh, he had been, uh, as he gave consideration and, and during prayer, uh, Paul came to the conclusion that his presence uh, was necessary in Philippi to minister to them that they would grow. And we're going to talk about uh, the fact that not only are you and I to bring glory to God, but we're also to care about others and their growth. We're to be growing, but we're also to be helping others grow. And it should be one of our concerns that in the spiritual life, our spiritual journey, 
It's not all just about us and how we're doing and how our life is, but it, the Christian life is supposed to be thinking about others. We know that Jesus modeled this, of course, in an intense way. He leaves heaven where he's getting all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. He tells us that in uh, John 17, that he had glory in heaven. He was given honor in heaven, and he leaves heaven, humbles himself, and comes to earth for us and for our good. So we're, we see modeled in Jesus, but also modeled in Paul the Apostle, that he wanted to do what was best for others, what was good for others. And so there's some real great teaching for the common Christian, uh, the comfortable common Christian that um, often doesn't think about glory to God, nor about the growth and the uh, have a concern about others. Let's look at the text we're uh, come, uh, drawing from this morning. Uh, we're looking at Philippians chapter 1 and uh, verse 19. For this, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and in hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so also in Christ, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now here we see that Paul made a, a, an absolute um, non-negotiable uh, determination of his life and ministry in verse 20 when he says, according to my earnest expectation and hope. This was his plan. He had this before him, prayerful, considering, and proactively that he was going to bring honor and bring glory to God. He said that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Paul lived in the constant uh, mindset of the presence of God now and the one day accountability that he would give before God. Often, uh, one of the things my mom would say to me often when I was going out, uh, when I was a kid, and I was planning on having fun, and my mom would say, uh, have a good evening, and uh, remember, uh, God sees everything that you do. <laughs> what a way to bum out a kid that's planning on having fun and going out and doing stuff that would uh, that maybe uh, she might not like, and this was her way of of reminding me that God would see everything. Well, Paul, he he didn't want to be ashamed about anything, but he knew that everything uh, went before the Lord. The child of God needs to be reminded. And let me just give you a, a quick text from Second Corinthians chapter five. It tells us that the child of God will give an accounting to God. Uh, as to the things that we do in this life, it'll go before him, whether they were good or bad, the scripture says. So I want to remind you that this is a good thing for us to live, live knowing we're in the presence of God. He sees us. He knows us. Hebrews 4 says that everything is naked to him to whom we must give an account. Now, that's not a threat. I'm your pastor. I need to teach you the whole counsel of God. And I have a responsibility to teach you that you are living in the presence of God. He knows you and sees you always, at all times, not just at church when you, you all look great this morning. So, you know, almost angelic in church on Sunday morning. There's almost a glow over all of you. Well, most of you few of you need to clean up a little bit, but most of us, most of you, but you know, God see, really knows us. He knows way beyond. He knows what we talked about on the way to church, maybe yelling at each other, and screaming at each other, and mad at each other, and then you pull into the church parking lot. And you, everybody puts on their little church smile and acts so happy and so good. You know how it is. I know how it is. I grew up in a regular Christian family, and, uh, but Paul here was determined when he uses words like this, earnest expectation, it was before him, planned and purposed. This was his, the word hope means a, an expectation that in nothing I shall be ashamed. 
before God, the one to whom all things are naked, but with all boldness, as always. Now, by now, it seems as if Paul would have been shut down. You think about what he went through, beaten, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, chained, uh, confined. Uh, for me, it doesn't take much to shake me and to get me upset. I don't know if any of you ever pout with God, but I do spiritually. I do a pout thing when I get mad at God, when God doesn't do what I want, or I'm not happy with God, and so I decide not to talk to him for a while. Anybody ever do that? Any confessions here? Wow. I feel a little bit alone. A couple waves, okay. Praise the Lord for a few honest... Oh, over here, hi. Thanks. A few honest people. Over here, you're also spiritual. Never get mad at God. Oh, okay. Come. Okay. Uh, but, you know, you think about what it does to shake you or to shut you down. It doesn't take much for most of us. Here, Paul, he was still determined no matter what happened, no matter what has happened or what's going to happen, he made a determination that he was going to, with all boldness, magnify the Lord. So now... Also, Christ will be magnified in my body. And that doesn't mean one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to praise him and thank him. No, 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 no. When he says in my body, he's talking about now present tense. In my body, now present tense, Christ will be magnified. And the word magnify is not hard. Now, let me just say, you cannot make him more than he already is but you should give him the glory for who he truly is. Giving him the, the, right, the rightful uh, honor that he deserves. That is what Paul was talking about, that Christ would be magnified in my body, and then look at the last part, by life or by death. No matter what happens, I'm going to magnify Christ. This, this Paul should inspire you and I. The life of Jesus and people like Paul the Apostle, this individual that was determined to stay the course and be faithful to the Lord, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What a great text of Scripture. So this morning, what we want to do is we want to talk about bringing glory to God, often, or magnifying the Lord, as he says here, which is essentially to bring glory to God. And often when we talk about something like that, at least for me, it seems to be kind of a nebulous concept that I really can't get a handle on. I want to I bring it to a place, not reducing it, but giving you understanding as to how you and I magnify the Lord or bring glory to God in our life and uh, our ministry. And we want to be doing that individually and the church corporately, bringing glory to God. Now we're going to see essentially that the scripture teaches that all of us were created to bring him glory. Just the fact that he is creator and we are creature, we were created and made to bring God glory. And uh, let's uh, note that uh, in scripture where it says that we're created and made for his glory. Turn with me to Isaiah 43 and verse 7. Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created, look at the next part, for my what? <laughs> glory. Whom I've created for my glory. Yes, I formed him. Yes, I have made him. Revelation 4 and verse 11, one of the things that John sees when he gets to view heaven and see what's happening in heaven, in the book of Revelation 4:11, we see that those around the throne are saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. Why? For you created all things. So fundamentally, foundationally, Young and old, all of us were created and made to bring glory to God. We were to reflect him and his greatness. We were to, uh, we were to honor him in our life and how we live, bringing glory to God. That's noted also in Revelation chapter 5 that uh, he was uh, give, being given in heaven glory that he deserved uh, and um, that he was to receive. Um, so let's look at, and what I want to do is I want to look at some instances because God is 
present everywhere at all times. But there were times when, special times when God manifested his presence. We're going to see especially in the life of Jesus. But before we look at the life of Jesus, where it literally, the glory of God was seen in his humanity because he was God in the flesh and the glory of God was seen when they saw Jesus. But before Jesus, we see that in the Old Testament and in his birth, the glory of God was physically, visibly present. Um, it tells us, it gives us a little insight as to why this took place. Listen, listen to Psalms 104 and verse 2. The psalmist said, or verse 1 and then verse 2. The psalmist said, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. Verse 2, who covered yourself with light as a garment who stretched out the heavens like a curtain. Here the psalmist gives us some theology of how God clothed himself with a garment of light. And I believe that when we look at some of the uh, Old Testament texts, we see this garment of light which manifested the presence, the glory, and the greatness of God, as the psalmist said in Psalms 104, verses 1 and 2. When the tabernacle was built, remember the tabernacle was a place where God was worshipped and where God was honored. It was a traveling it was a traveling temple, so to speak. When Israel traveled, they had what's called the tabernacle. And in the book of uh, Exodus, chapter 40, 34, it tells us that the glory of the Lord was seen in the tabernacle. Listen to this. And the cloud covered the tabernacle, covered the tabernacle of the meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of the meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So when we see in the Old Testament here the glory of the Lord, it is his greatness, his splendor, his power, which in a moment in time was manifested, a place in which it was manifested. God is everywhere. But we don't see his glory everywhere at all times. But we're going to see that you and I are supposed to manifest just like as this temp, as this tabernacle, it, it was a place where God was able to manifest his presence. Thus people saw his glory. Now we're connecting dots. Stay with me. This is a logical. And what, you're, what this should do for the church, now it might not, but this would be my goal as your pastor teacher that you for the rest of your life would know why you were created and why you were made and what you're supposed to do. If you get that settled, that'll help you in all of your life and living. You were created and made to bring glory and honor to God. That's why we were created and made. And you won't just say, well, the Bible tells us somewhere that you know, we're supposed to give glory to God. It was like, the Bible says, I was created and made for his glory. I give him glory because that's why I was made. And it lays a biblical theological foundation for bringing honor and glory to God. More than the pastor said that I'm supposed to give God glory. That's not enough. That's not good enough. And there's going to be a lot of circumstances that's going to cause you to say, well, maybe in this circumstance I'm not going to glorify God. Or I don't need to glorify God anymore. Well, no, in all circumstances, because you were created by him, <laughs> And you are a creature created to give him glory. And so you create a conviction about the fact that you're going to bring honor and glory to him. This glory of God was also seen in the temple, Solomon's temple, which was a permanent dwelling and a permanent place uh, established by Israel to worship, worship the Lord. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5, we'll pick up at verse 13. 2 Chronicles 5.13, Indeed it came to pass that when the trumpeters and the singers were as one, that means they, were, uh, they had practiced and rehearsed, and the instrumentalists and the singers uh, were as one to make one sound and to be heard in praising and thanking God. 
And when they lifted up their voices with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music, and they praised God, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Here in a moment in time, God manifested his presence in the tabernacle, and now in the temple, God was there. And the glory of the Lord filled that place. His presence was manifested. Now, bear with me. <laughs> Let me give you another illustration. When Moses was on the mount, there was the glory of the Lord. We won't go there. But in the proclamation of the birth of Jesus in Luke Two. Now we're going to move into the New Testament and see where the glory of the Lord was manifested. Listen to this. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, there was in the same country shepherds living out in the flock, uh, living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them. And listen to this. This is a well-known Christmas text, right? Proclamation by the, and the angel of the Lord. And they, uh, the angel of the Lord stood before these shepherds and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. They saw the glory of God, the bright light of the glory of God. It was the, it was the cloud that led Israel, the pillar of fire by night that led Israel. <laughs> it was the glory, the presence of God was experienced in this moment in time, and it caused them to be afraid. When Jesus was on earth, let me give you what they saw in John 1.14. We're taking a little bit of a leap now. Okay. When Jesus took on flesh, and the Word became flesh, the eternal Logos, that John 1, 1 says the Word was, was with God and the Word was God. And the Word, the Logos, eternal Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His what? Glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was the embodiment. He was, remember what it said, his name shall be called Jesus, which being translated means what? God with us. When they saw Jesus in the flesh, it was the, they saw the very glory, the very glory of God. This is further documented in Hebrews 1, 3, where it says of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. Who being who? Jesus being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. So Jesus brought the glory of God in the flesh. They beheld it. They saw the glory of God when they saw Jesus. Jesus says in John 14, 19, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Now let me just make a quick note. For some of you that might be here this morning, maybe you're a seeker. Maybe you're here to see one. So you're a grandparent or a parent that came to see your kids sing and we're glad that you're here this morning and we welcome you. I had three grandkids up there singing this morning. And uh, it blessed my heart, <laughs> you know. I mean, I almost started crying up here a little, you know. Had, and I don't do that very often, but my grandkids can do that. They jerk on you a little bit in ways that your kids never could. And, uh, you know, just to see one of my little ones belting out praise in honor and glory to God. We're so thankful for the Ramses and the wonderful job that they do. Amen? And praise the Lord. For <laughs> wonderful wonderful, uh, godly couple. Pray for them and uh, bless them by thanking them 
Uh, they have volunteered for years here now through the pandemic. They faithfully recorded every week the children's minute to minister to the kids. Uh, an amazing couple that God has blessed us with. We don't take their presence. We do sometimes take it for granted, but we shouldn't. And I'm so thankful for them. But um, whatever reason you're here this morning, we're glad you're here. We have a live stream audience also that listens each week. We're glad that they're here. When I, the next part of our sermon talks about how we bring glory to God. That's the, that Paul determined that he was going to magnify Christ. And I want to talk about how you and I can magnify the Lord or bring glory to the Lord, which I think uh, we need to know. But you and I cannot do that as we were originally born in Adam. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the scripture says... For all have sinned, this is Romans 3.23, that's the verse I really wanted to give. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, let me just say that we're born in Adam and God loves you so much. That's why he sent Jesus, that Jesus came, that we could have relationship with God the Father, that we could bring glory to God as we were created and made to do. But we can't do that in the original fallen creation. We're all in Adam. We're all born in sin, the Bible tells us, separated from God, actually the enemies of God. And um, that's our soul. Uh, is We're spiritually dead. Um, Ephesians 2 says we're dead in trespasses and sin, Ephesians 2, 1. So you, a, an individual can't bring glory to God as they were created to bring in, in the old man, but in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says we become new creatures, new, a new creation. The new creation is the new person you can become through faith in Christ. Um, I don't think that's the verse, but um, that's a nice verse. But um, <coughs> 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Um, and uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus, remember the really, this thing, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. That's the child of God is in Christ, a new creation. Now you have a new capacity, but you also have a new expectation. This is not like an option. This is, this is God's plan and purpose for you. We're going to see that he planned and purpose that you would be conformed to the image of his son and bring him honor and glory. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus said to Nicodemus uh, in, in John 3, 3, Nick, Nick he, he was a religious guy, but he wasn't, didn't have relationship with God through faith in Christ. He said, Nicodemus, he said, you, you need to be born again. You need a new life. You, have a, you had a physical birth, but now you need a spiritual birth. If we're going to bring glory to God, we need new life, which comes through faith in Christ that gives us the capacity, the strength, the power, and the ability to bring glory and honor. Nicodemus needed a new life, needed to be born again. And um, without it, he couldn't see the kingdom of God. He also was spiritually dead and separated from God. All right. So let's talk about us becoming the person that brings honor and glory to God. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to pick up at verse 18. But the verses before it talk about Moses when he was on the mount and in the presence of God. It tells us that when he came down from the mount, when he spoke to the people, his face literally glowed, it says. Do you remember the story? Some, most of you do. Many of you do. And uh, it's in, in the Old Testament text, it says he glowed because he had been in the glory, presence of the glory of God, and they put a veil over him to cover him, his face. And in the text here, it talks about the fact that we... Uh, unveiled face, we have this privilege of relationship now. As a child of God, we have privilege of relationship that no, no other um, time period uh, in the work of God on earth has ever experienced. The fact that we can be, think about the fact that in the Old Testament, they only once a year went into the Holy of Holies. Think about just this one fact. Once a year, they, go, they went into the Holy of Holies. You and I can go into the Holy of Holies how often? All the time, every day. Not because you're righteous or because I'm righteous, because of the righteousness of Christ. This is biblical foundation laid, okay? Christ's righteousness makes you accepted before him. 
His righteousness. We can go into the whole. We have a privilege of being in the presence of God. And we're going to see that the teaching of Scripture, as Jesus said, when he left, he was going to give us the Holy Spirit, which was going to lead us and guide us and teach us. The Spirit of God aids us and assists us. The Word of God and the Spirit of God, are, we're going to see, are the two primary transforming ingredients or elements. They are the two things which brings about change and growth that we would bring God glory. Look what it says in this text. But we all, with unveiled faces, behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. The child of God in his intimate relationship with the Lord, in prayer, in Bible study, in meditation on Scripture. Remember the story of Mary and Martha where Martha, Mary sits at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus said that was a good thing. The most important thing in this story, that story was sit at the feet of Jesus, listen to Jesus, be in the presence of Jesus. That's what we need to do, that we would be in his presence, beholding his glory. And as we do that, it uses this word transformation. As we, with unveiled faces, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, changed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. This is a powerful text that talks about the work that God wants to do in your reading, in your worship, in your meditation, in your time of fellowship with the Lord, that you're seeing Him. Let me give you just a quick illustration, because I want some of you, I'm not sure you're getting it. Re when you read the story of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, and you get to the part of the story where Jesus, you know, is, is kneeling down and washing Imagine washing the feet of Judas, knowing that Judas is going to betray him. You meditate on that text. It changes. Th that guy would constitute an enemy, an evil enemy in the presence of Jesus, and he's washing his feet. Do you want to be changed, transformed, a new person? You're looking at Jesus. In a mirror, you see the glory of the Lord. You see Jesus for what he does. And it changes you how you're going to treat your mate today. They're at least not a Judas, you think. <laughs> right? <laughs> She's not that bad. Guys, come on. <laughs> He's not that bad. <laughs> but you're... You're in the, you know, so you read that text and you're going to be transformed, changed. And you're going to be, your mate is going to be going, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you talking or treating me with this kindness and this love? You don't need to be pseudo-spiritual and say, well, as I was meditating on the text about Jesus. <laughs> but give God glory that God is at work in my life and changing me. I don't want to be the same person I've been. I want to be more like Christ. You see, when you spend time, one of the things my son reflected today, came over and told me, I guess it was in the last service, and he, Josh comes over and we're standing there and he says, it's kind of funny, I was looking at, you know, you and me and I think Tanner and then Hudson was up here and he said, you know, we were all, we were all standing exactly the same way, holding our bodies the same. Here's three generations of Cousinos. And we've been in each other's presence and we have the same genes and blood. Guess what? We've been, when we're in the presence of Jesus, we're going to be changed, transformed. And people know it's not because you're so wonderful, but God gets glory to the glory of God, transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Glory to glory means a step to step from one step to the next. The Spirit of God. Remember when uh, 
Uh, oh, we're almost out of time. Remember when um, Peter and John in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they, 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 uh, and they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. Here were rugged fishermen. Rugged, rough fishermen. And they knew they were uneducated and untrained and they marveled at Peter and they marveled at John and the way they spoke and the, the power and authority with which they spoke. And the reason, they knew the reason and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Why was Peter the way Peter was and John was the way he was? Because they had been with Jesus. And he changes us so that we can bring honor and glory to him as we were created and made to be. The, the plan of God was, according to Romans 8, 29, that we'd be pre, we were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. It was God's plan that we would be like him. 1 John 2, 6 says that if we abide in him, we ought to walk just as he walked. 1 John 2 and verse 6. 1 Peter 2, 22 says that we should follow in his footsteps. Well, let's spend a little bit of time with Jesus as we prepare for the table of the Lord this morning. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 26, we're preparing for taking of the bread and taking of the cup. We're remembering Jesus and what he went through for us. It says, then when they had released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus... And he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers took Jesus and they gathered around him. Verse 28. And they stripped him. And they put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had tw twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and a reed in his hand they bowed the knee before him and mocked him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and they took the reed and they struck him on the head. And when they mocked him, they took off the robe and they put on his own clothes and they led him away to be crucified. Lord, I pray your blessing on the bread as we remember you. Just reading this text, remembering how, Lord, you had been beaten, mocked, spit upon, stripped, a crown of thorns, platted upon your head. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking our sin in your body. The wages of sin is death. You paid that death. You paid the price. And for that, we thank you. Bless this bread. As we remember you, I pray in Jesus' name. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do it in remembrance of Jesus. We're reminded, Jesus, that it cost you everything. In this cup, we're reminded that you shed your blood. Without the shedding of blood, there be no remission of sins. Thank you for shedding your blood for us. And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them. And he said, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. So we take this cup.
remembrance of Jesus shed blood for us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Bless your people, the word to our lives. This time of remembrance. Help the church corporately to bring honor and glory and praise to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you.